Westfield Memorial Hospital provides high-quality health care to residents of Western New York, offering patients the most sophisticated medical advancements while keeping the ease and familiarity of a community hospital. Support for Chautauqua Sunrise has been provided by WRFA 107.9 FM, Jamestown's public radio station, streaming online 24-7 at WRFALP.com. Low power to the people. Chautauqua Sunrise is made possible by a grant from Fredonia Place, a continuing care retirement community providing dignity in a modern luxury environment. Meter's Restaurant, a family tradition for over 50 years in downtown Ripley, is a proud supporter of Chautauqua Sunrise. Meter's provides all-day dining, banquet services, and custom catering, specializing in pie. Funding for Chautauqua Sunrise is provided in part by the Chautauqua County Industrial Development Agency with offices in Jamestown, Dunkirk, and Westfield, helping businesses to prosper throughout Chautauqua County. The Chautauqua Center. Are you looking for affordable medical, dental, or counseling services? The Chautauqua Center is always accepting new patients at their Jamestown and Dunkirk locations. They offer discounted prescriptions and accept all insurances. From the Access Chautauqua Studios in Mayville, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Chautauqua Sunrise is hosted by Doc Hamels and supported by the award-winning volunteers at Access Chautauqua. We are here to share local news, colorful interviews, and events of interest to everyone. Chautauqua Sunrise is broadcast live Saturday mornings each week from 9 to 10 a.m. Send events via email or call us live. Check us out on YouTube and Facebook. And now, from the Access Chautauqua Studios, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Hey everybody, good morning. I'm Doc Hamels and welcome to Chautauqua Sunrise. Well, there's a sunrise out there, I'm sure of it. It's, it's a cloudy Saturday. First time we've had a cloudy Saturday in some time. Say that ten times fast. Well, anyways, glad you could join us. I want to say good morning to everybody, of course, that's watching here on 1301 uh, in Spectrum, and also for those of you that are watching us uh, as we're streaming live throughout the universe, glad you could join us. I want to say good afternoon to all of our listeners on WRFA 107.9, low power to the people. Glad you could join us as well. Uh, got a great show in store for you. We're going to do a historical look back onto, uh, well, I think that's really a cool thing that took place for over 10 years here in Chautauqua County. There's your teaser line. I'm not going to go any further, but do stay tuned because we got some really interesting things to talk about and some fun things to share. All right. <clears throat> Want to do a shout out to Emerald Weish. Uh, she's supposed to be here today. I don't, Emerald, where are you? <laughs> she graduated last night. I think she's all tuckered out. Um, but uh, congratulations, class of 2020, to all of you, including Emerald. Uh, we wish you the very best in all your endeavors in the future. This will be one for the record book, I'm sure, as far as your memories. But uh, be strong, and, and you're going to do fine. Well, <clears throat> slowly but surely, uh, areas are opening up through this pandemic. I know that I was over at one of our former... Um, Underwriters, Bella Salon and Day Spa there in Northeast. And uh, I was just watching women coming in in droves like they were just so excited. And it was fun because uh, Channel 12 News was there uh, from Erie and they were talking to folks and realizing that this is something that people have been waiting for weeks to get back to the salons for all their services. So I'm sure that all of the restaurants and the salons and all the other retail places in the area are glad to at least be on part li uh, partly online, even if it's only 50% capacity. <sighs> We're slowly getting there. <clears throat> you know, I was talking to my guest earlier, and I and I shared a, a little thing I saw on Facebook. So this is something you, you, you can mention to people that are being stubborn about their uh, face masks. 
You know, and as much as uh, people complain about our, 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 our governor, I suppose, of, of how he handled things, I thought he did a pretty good job, he kept us safe. It was tough at times to want to, to, to wait it out, but look at what's going on in the rest of the country. I think we're, we did all right. So the, the comment I, I read was, if you don't <clears throat> like wearing your mask, you're really going to hate the ventilator. Think about that one, okay? So anyways, um, I want to also tell you that uh, we are ending six years of broadcasting here at Chautauqua Sunrise. And yeah, they're cheering in the, over in the engineering room. Uh, it seems hard to believe this is show 312. Wow. You know, I used to uh, remark on Reed Powers when he had the senior report, he had like, I don't know, 18 years, 900 some shows. Well, <laughs> we're sneaking up on him. But anyways, six great years. Next week we'll be starting our seventh year or so. Uh, thanks to all the staff and the crew here, they're all volunteers. We, we have a lot of fun here, and it, it's a passion, it's a mission what we do. And uh, today is going to be another example of all the good stuff that's in Chautauqua County that we want to share with you. Speaking of good stuff, um, starting later today, you're not going to see it for a while yet, but uh, the crew, uh, including myself, we're going to be producing something called Chautauqua Strong and Healthy. Now, you saw the public service announcements called Chautauqua Strong that we brought uh, government uh, department heads in uh, the, the county executive when we talked about uh, how to handle and prepare yourself for the pandemic and the, the, the coronavirus and stuff like that. And that went over very, very well. Well, we got a call and uh, they wanted to do a series uh, on healthy practices for folks that maybe can't get out of the house as much or just some things that uh, you want to think about so anyways so stay stay tuned and keep your eye open in the next couple of weeks you're going to see uh, various um, <clears throat> ad additions of chautauqua strong and healthy so keep that in mind it'll be right here on channel 1301 they won't be live they'll be taped and uh chris will make them look pretty and and so forth but i'll be uh hosting that series so we're looking forward to beginning that process. We'll tell you more about that as we go along. I have a few announcements I want to share with you that have come in, and some of it is uh, Chamber of Commerce stuff, some of it's uh, uh, economic stuff, but I'd like to share some of this from time to time because we're so caught up in our, our listening and watching on the pandemic or other things that are going on and, and the protests and so forth, uh, but there's, there's, there's stuff going on behind the scenes that I think would be kind of interesting to know. Okay, so what's this all about? This is from the Chautauqua Chamber of Commerce. As the economy continues to reopen and businesses begin hiring, background screening becomes increasingly important. The hiring process can be complicated, particularly at a time when businesses are not only ramping up their operations, but also putting into place measures to keep their workplaces safe. Business is not as usual anymore. You walk into most places, there's a lot of masks and sanitizing and uh, acrylic windows between you. The Chamber uh, and the Manufacturers Association Southern Tier can help to ease some of the burden. They're proud to announce a new background screening partnership. Chamber and the MAST uh, members are eligible for discounted rates for any screening service offered through the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce. Okay, if you're interested in any of this, give them a call at 366-6200 or 484-1101. The Chamber also wants you to know the following. Uh, they serve you, uh, the members and investors throughout the region, and it remains a top priority given the uh, financial challenges posed by the COVID-19. They have made some staff scheduling adjustments through June and July in an effort to reduce their costs. Office hours in the Jamestown office will be by appointment only. Their Dunkirk office remains closed as part of the Jamestown Community Campus closure. Uh, they'll respond as quickly as possible to your calls and emails. <clears throat> because staff will be working part-time, there may be a delay in getting back to you, of course. And this is true of a lot of companies and agencies. Uh, we ask for your patience. Um, for information, again, give them a call at 366-6200 or 484-1101. <clears throat> Mark Geis, uh, who is the, uh, the executive for the, uh, the IDA, the Industrial Development Agency for the, uh, the county, sent over a few things that I wanted to share, and I'm just going to try to summarize a few of them. 
But they wanted you to know that the, the IDA is investing in ECR, in the Dunkirk and uh, Utica facilities. All right, I'll try to do this as best I can. Sometimes when I get these announcements, they're not written for me, they're written for the newspaper, so I gotta kinda redo them a bit. At a recent meeting, the County Industrial Development Agency Board of Directors approved financial assistance to ECR, including an extension of the existing pilot agreement that's providing real property tax abatement and sales tax abatements for substantial new investment plan here in the county. Mark Geis, the county's deputy county executive, and you've seen him here on the show, and CEO of the IDA. It says, for over 90 years, ECR has been an industry leader in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning uh, market. We are pleased that we could support their ongoing local uh, investment and growth, which will result in the retention of a significant number of jobs and an even stronger foothold in Chautauqua County. Okay, so that's a good thing that, that your IDA, uh, you, that's all supported through uh, funds and so forth. And uh, Mark and the crew there are working on that. Now, here's another one that the IDA is involved with. Uh, the community is one step closer to once again smelling petri baking products or their cookies in the heart of downtown Silver Creek. If you've ever been through Silver Creek when they were open, you could smell cookies. Uh, it's June 23rd meeting, the Chautauqua Industrial Development Agency again approved financial incentives to support Petrie uh, baking products, establishing a new bakery in Silver Creek in the same facility that still brandishes its name. And that was operating since 1982 through 2012 before they had a uh, close up. So anyways, more jobs on the way in those two uh, places. And then, let's see here. This is, this is kind of interesting. You're, you're, we're seeing a little bit about this in the newspapers. Uh, solar energy in the area. Uh, there was a, something in the paper the other day over in Sherman. There's a project in South Ripley. This one's in Portland. Um, and it says here that the abundant solar power uh, company is one step closer to constructing a 2.5 megawatt alternating current uh, solar array in Portland following approval of incentives by the board of directors again of the IDA. The project will generate renewable solar energy for the town of Portland and surrounding communities within the New York independent system uh, operator zone. Okay, so again, IDA is working on other kinds of projects. All right, enough for those guys. Uh, there's a reminder that you still have a couple days left that you can vote for Chautauqua Institution because they've been nominated by the USA Today's Best Small Town Cultural Scene. And just like the, uh, the uh, Business Revolution where Fredonia won uh, season five and the National Comedy Center won the USA Today Best New M Museum poll, you could help uh, Chautauqua get uh, voted into that particular category. So that's really cool. But you got till the 29th. Okay, we're gonna jump around here a bit. Fourth of July, what's happening on the Fourth of July? No parade this year. We're not gonna be set up in front of the library. We're bummed. Rick Mascaro can stay home and sleep in that morning. I won't be there. But a Fourth of July fireworks display will take place uh, at Lakeside Park in Mayville. The committee that oversees the annual Independent Day Independence Day festivities announced Tuesday that the display will begin at the park at 10 p.m. The park will be closed to visitors out of safety concerns. Hmm. We feel that shooting them from the park over the lake gives more viewing opportunities for everyone. There you go. The committee said in a message posted to Facebook, you should be about to see them pretty much from anywhere on the north side of the lake. We ask that you and your fellow New York State uh, folks uh, dis use the distance. Wait a minute. Oh, here we go. We ask that you follow New York State distancing guidelines. Uh, we are happy to uh, be able to give everyone some sense of normalcy and, and be able to celebrate our country's uh, birthday. Thank you for being patient with us. Okay. Of course, the annual parade that takes place in Mayville on the 4th of July has been canceled due to the pandemic. All right. So anyways, you're going to have uh, fireworks on the 4th of July at 10 o'clock. Kind of cool. All right. Uh, also, in, if you're interested in meeting with our Congressman Tom Reed, there's going to be a uh, get-together on July 16th, and it's going to be an online event at 8.30 a.m. And uh, if you're interested, you just give the Chamber of Commerce a call, and they'll get you hooked up on that. Okay. Well, we have a slide on this one. Slide 16, Jeff. 
Family and Caregiver Support Group, PAX Tools Edition, okay? Basically, this is to provide a welcoming environment for parents, family members, and other caregivers of individuals with developmental disabilities to meet, share experiences, ask questions, and receive help, okay? Do you want to reduce conflict, have better relationships, help your children manage their own behaviors? You need PAX Tools. All right, so this is going to be on July 9th, uh, Thursday, uh, from 6.30 to p.m. to 8 o'clock, and also on July 23rd, 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, there, it's a Zoom meeting, and if you're interested, give them a call at 332-4170. And that, oh, I'm sorry, it said you had a slide for that. Okay. Anyways, so you can give them a call, again, 332-4170, and uh, uh, it's free of charge. Okay. And let's see, I think I am out of announcements. So uh, we're going to be right back. Stay tuned. I'm Doc Hamels. Music, but we still have to change. There we go. We're going to start the show in five, four, three. On Rolling Hills Radio, you'll hear grassroots Americana music from a wide range of genres. There aren't many shows like this. <laughs> Just like mine. There's something going on that doesn't fit into folk or country or rock or blues or bluegrass, but it has something to do with all of that in a way. So they came up with the word Americana. Folk music, Americana, the spirit of this music uh, uh, kind of hit America in the heart over the last 10 years. I kept up with my classical training really until a few years ago, so I had over two decades of classical violin in my life. Then we <laughs> came along. <laughs> Getting out of the mainstream of the mass media means that you will hear things that you have never heard before, never imagined things that can change your day. I got the blues from a baby limbo by the San Francisco Bay. That's, well, I didn't know it was Mick Jagger, because nobody knew it. <laughs> <laughs> he was about 12 years old. You can find us on non-commercial outlets from coast to coast on global community radio. Harmony. For a pound of silver and gold. <laughs> I know, man, there's a whole raft of non sequiturs coming your way. <laughs> Our side. And we are determined to stay independent of pressure to appeal to a mainstream audience. Ride, ride, ride. I write more from a place of sadness and darkness than happiness, because when you're happy, you're happy. And, and, uh, and I'm also trying to break myself out of that. We were talking about how folk music came about in the 60s, the social protest of, of folk songs. And we were thinking, I'm not sure that the, the younger people are doing that to quite that intensity. We were wrong about that. <laughs> Things take time there. Uh, it's funny, it took time. It took like four years to finish that song. I heard him sing, the water is white, and I think that it's important, especially uh, for young people, you know, you got to learn how to uh, use your voice, and it really is easy to totally screw it up if you don't sing correctly. Sit alone and I don't say a word. No, I don't. What do you call it? Do you have a name for that? Washboard. Oh, a washboard. I can hear the river. Don't you know that I can see the water? Don't you? Uh, I've had a lot of songs recorded by other artists, uh, but this was this one was recorded by Joe Cocker in the, in the early 90s. Put some girls, some of my girls, through school. There's nobody coming. It's always been us. 
I don't want to be rich, I don't want to be poor, I don't want to be theirs, I don't want to be yours, and I don't want to wait for somebody to love. There's nobody coming, it's always been us. It's, I think for me, songs always come out of lack and, and, and longing. And Ours is a simple faith. Life is a short embrace. Heaven is in. That's a radical act, you know, in 21st century uh, uh, America. You really make a difference in so many ways when you come and support um, support this. It's important work that you're doing here. A lot of very fine music was kind of being squeezed out and you're pushing it back in. The, the, the kind of support that you give us makes it possible. We simply couldn't do the show without you folks. And that's as simple as that is. Okay, folks, and we're back. <clears throat> You're watching Chautauqua Sunrise. <clears throat> Over the last six years, I, were, I would get public service announcements from this guy named Ken Harley in Rolling Hills Radio. And I used to say, who the heck writes these things? Because they are loquacious. They are superlative. They are things that only Ken Harley would write or someone that he paid to have written. And I would just sit there and laugh as I read them. I want to welcome back to the show, Ken Harley. Good morning, Ken. Oh, it's great to be back, Doc. <laughs> you know, I asked you to come back to the show because I was really sad to see that you were kind of calling it a day with Rolling Hills Radio after 10 years. Well, that's a long time. That's a lot of work. <clears throat> yeah, when we started out, I was but a kid, Doc. And, uh, <laughs> I'm your child. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I wanted to take this opportunity today to... Um, give you a gift because you've given so many gifts to the community through music but I want to give you a gift that you could tell your story it'll be memorialized forever and ever <laughs> you get a DVD when you leave and but it, it fits what I have always said here we like to talk about the good stuff of Chautauqua County and Rolly Hills Radio is like a poster child of what's really good here in Chautauqua County I'm glad I came this morning right <laughs> <laughs> I even wrote that part myself <laughs> But I'm serious, I'm awesome. serious. And not just because I'm a musician, but because I, I've watched the impact of that. I've talked to people who've gone to your shows. I went to one of them with Tom Paxton. I got to talk to the man. It was like, really like one of my top five great music moments to talk with someone like that. And yeah. that was just really cool. Yeah, we had a lot of that over the years. And it's not <laughs> anything we necessarily expected. In 2010, we were in the basement of the lab, the first show, six people showed up and they, they were all related to one of the artists. They were brothers and sisters and dad. And we, uh, we had Katie Elfman and Tiny B. And that's pretty much what we were going to do. And then WRFA basically got uh, involved. They did get involved. Show number two, Ed Tomasini came from WRFA to do the sound. We yep. had the support of uh, Jason Sample and Dennis Jason. Drew who yep. really gave us some traction. And by show three, we were filling up the room. And after that, we had, uh, it was more than standing room only. People were lined up all the way down the block to get in. Now, you said the lab. You meant the labyrinth, right? The labyrinth, yes. Yeah, and it holds like six people. <laughs> it seemed like, <laughs> we, yeah. We, we, for, uh, for the Infinity Showcase, we used to play there once. No, I, I don't know, what, 20 people? I mean, it's not. Four, four, we squeezed them in. 40, 45, we ended oh, up. Of course, you know, I think they rearranged some of it because they used to have a lot of boxes in the corners and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, 45 yeah. people in the labyrinth. Wow. Yeah, it, it was tight. But you know, people would come early and have dinner and things like that. But then we just outgrew it. We stayed there as long as we could. Yeah, but why 2010? Why did you do this? Oh, I uh, couldn't think of anything else, else to do. No, I actually, <laughs> I was listening to Wood Song's uh, Old Time Radio Hour mm -hmm. and just kind of got the idea, geez, it'd be nice to do, I, I love that show. So let's do a little local show like that. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I know, we start getting national artists. So the first one we had was Bat McGrath. Then we got John McEwen from Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. We got Jim Lauderdale. And it just kind of took off from there. And, uh, you know, we started drawing. We've drawn as many as t uh, 215 people for Tom Chapin. We drew uh, about a 200 people for Tom Tony Trishka. It just got a life of its own. Nothing I ever expected. <laughs> in fact, I wasn't sure I could do what you do. I had never interviewed anybody in my entire life. And I thought, well, I can play music and I can do this and that. I don't know if I can interview people. 
But I did not know until the show started is musicians never shut up. So I could just ask one question and sit back and relax if I wanted. You see to. what I'm doing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a musician. I, I never sh back. It's shut like, up. This is not a problem. And, yeah, they were glad when I left the house this morning. They were like, oh, finally, peace and quiet. <laughs> I was going to be gone for a couple of hours. <laughs> but, but, but it's true. Musicians just are bursting as a rule with, with stories and, yeah. uh, of the road, of their lives, their music, and so forth. So, so this started out with just an idea, just like a coffee house, or what was the in your mind? What, what, what did you? What was the form for it? Yeah, a coffee house. We became an affiliate of Woodsong's Old Time Radio Hour. Mm -hmm. in the first couple of years, we were the Woodsong's Coffee House Radio Hour. At that time, they had sixty affiliates around the world. And then, as time go, went on, it became apparent that we needed to become independent. So mm -hmm. we did. That's when we became Rolling Hills, and. Um, you know, the concept was to kind of follow the format of wood songs, and we kind of did. But then we broke free of that. And so, what was the format? <clears throat> uh, just, uh, just like Michael Jonathan does, we uh, started off a song. I started off with a song. The first artist uh, song interview song. The second artist song interview song. Same thing for the second half of the show. What I what we did do that no no other show did at that time was we had a finale with all of the musicians on the stage. We played together, mm -hmm. and that was a lot of fun. Um, that was always jumping off the high board because we never quite knew what was going to happen. <laughs> do, do styles uh, uh, kind of gel. Start that one more time. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah, we had 20 minutes to rehearse it prior to the show in mm -hmm. the dressing room, and that was it. Um, and it almost always went very very well. I have often wondered because, like I said, I, I, unfortunately I didn't get it over as many times as I wanted to, but. I watched the Tom Paxton show, and I, I've talked about that here on, on, on my show, that how it was, and it was really fun. But it was like these guys pull in that morning, and you meet, meet them for the first time. I wish, you, I mean, is there a lot? Of, there's got to be a lot of prep ahead of time, isn't there? There's a little bit of prep, yeah. Uh, first of all, they usually show. We ask them to show up four hours before the show, mm -hmm. and that that was pretty much it. So we do the sound checking, and I could brief them about what was going to be happening. We usually had a fair amount of email back and forth. Um, a, a lot about the finale, what key should we do it in, who's going to sing what, and those kinds of things. We did a little bit of that, and um, and I, I would explain what how the show was going to go and what the format was going to be. Most of the artists got the memo. A couple did not. A couple mm -hmm. showed up and they thought it was going to be a concert. And uh, that provided for a little tense moment here and there. <laughs> they just, uh, their system, their manager or whatever just fell apart and they never got the information. Um, and when they expected a concert, and this was very different than that. Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because there's stops and starts. And there's, like you said, if, with the Wood Songs format, it's not where you just get up there and you play 16 songs and say, good night, everybody. Right. You get interviewed and you do this and that yeah. and, and so on. Yeah, there's a structure. They don't run the show. And most musicians <laughs> are used to it. They've got a concert. They do this for an hour and a half, and right. they say whatever they want. They come want. up with their, their song sets, and, and this is how we're going to do it, and, and these are the jokes and all that good stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. They, get, really? they have their own rhythm. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, when we get started, they find out they're going according to my rhythm. Mm -hmm. and, it all, and I almost always worked out. I yeah. felt like a ringmaster. Yeah. And I, um, what was it like? To rub elbows with like John McEwen, I mean the nitty gritty dirt band. I mean some of these really way high the A class musicians. I mean not the others aren't A class, but I mean the ones that I knew. I mean they're right up there. That must have been pretty pretty exciting. Tom Paxton had a lifetime Grammy award yeah. along with Bing Crosby and yeah. you know, and uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, so yeah, that was really something. And John McEwen from Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. These are guys. I mean, I, I decided to play banjo after listening to John McEwen on, mm -hmm. on Nitty Gritty Dirt Band in 1970 with the Ruler Circle be Unbroken album. So there were a lot of people like that. And I'm not a person who gets starstruck very easily. So most of it went pretty okay. I have mm -hmm. to say that when Robin and Linda Williams showed up, I, I found myself a little bit speechless because they they've always been musical heroes to me. Mm -hmm. And you know, on the Garrison Keillor show, uh, Prairie Home Companion, and I actually knew them before that. Oh, wow. Knew of their music, I should say mm -hmm. it that way. Um, but yeah, to uh, actually stand on stage and play music with Tom Paxton and Brian Bowers, these living legends, yeah. it was. Uh, once in a while, I had to pinch myself. I felt like I was on one of those baseball camps where you go and play baseball in the springtime with the New York Yankees. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of felt like, wow, here I'm playing with uh, Tom Chapin. How does that happen? <laughs> I, um, 
course, you know, I, I would do your announcements, and I kind of embellished them a little bit. And, the, and I used to say, the music is great, but the fun part also is meeting them afterwards. The, the meet and greet portion of it. And, well, and, I, and I shared the story, and I'll share a little bit of it again. I, Tom was at the bar getting a drink, Tom Paxton. <laughs> and I thought, well, gosh, this is my golden moment to meet somebody I highly respect. And because uh, I played his music, and I went up to him and I told him the story how uh, Will, Russell and I, we played for the uh, uh, Home for Christmas concert series that Dennis Drew put together a few years ago, and we did the uh, Marvelous Toy. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and there's, you know, there's a pop in there in, in the chorus line. Well, in the audience, all of a sudden I hear these popping sounds. <laughs> And, and, then, and then the next verse, more popping sounds. And so I, I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And then at the end of the, when we were all done, I went off stage and I was talking to some, one of the kids that was in a chorus. He said, you hear us? And I go, uh, what? <laughs> and what they were doing is they were taking their water bottles, putting their thumbs in there, and they, go, and they, were, <laughs> they were doing these kind of sounds. Well, there was hundreds of these pop bottles, or water bottles popping all over the place. Well, I shared this with Tom. And, he got quite a kick out of that. And of course, I had to have the uh, the required photo with him, and my said, "My wife, here, take this. Here's my photo. Oh, take yeah. my picture." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that. that was a great introduction uh, video when we just we just saw a, a little bit ago. Um, Rolling Hills Radio wasn't filmed originally, was it? It, it was, was not. No. So tell me the, <clears throat> the the transformation of this. I mean, this this became a high polished production. It did, despite my involvement. <laughs> no matter what yeah. you did, it did. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we turned it into a television show, and that kind of took off, too. So, um, yeah, and, and the, uh, we became nationally syndicated yeah. in our, I think, sixth or seventh season. And we went all over the country, in fact, all over the world. We were in South Africa. In fact, they're still playing us in South Africa. I have uh, the, the station manager got a hold of us just, oh, just a few weeks ago and said, it's a, it's a huge hit over here. So maybe I'll move to South Africa. I don't know. But uh, now, do you own the show? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have the copyright to all that stuff. But you know, we're pretty much done with it. It said uh, discover Rolling Hills Radio dot org. Don't don't try that because it's all shut down. Now. <laughs> the whole thing is is over with. We're going to end on episode number one hundred at Chautauqua with John McEwen and the String Wizards. Uh, but because of the pandemic, we couldn't do our last four. So you did ninety nine shows. Uh, we ended up with 96 because we couldn't do our we couldn't do our last four shows. We, we had the Blue Heron scheduled, yeah. and that's been canceled. And then our last shows, our last two shows, had to be had to be canceled that we were doing at Shawbox. So how did you go from the labyrinth with six people to South Africa? I mean, how did you get to the TV aspect? I, I'm I'm curious. Well, we just we simply decided to do that. In fact, right here on the station was the first to carry our to mm -hmm. carry our show. Right. And that kind of took off. Uh, the, the, the audio was always much more popular, the mm -hmm. radio was. And we ended before we could really get the, the uh, video out there. But it attracted the attention. Of, for example, Don Dixon was interested. He saw the show. And he's the, uh, pro he produced R.E.M. and Hootie and the Blowfish and people like that. And, and, uh, real, and he and I spent some time talking afterwards and uh, got some great ideas from him. He, in fact, he suggested I stop doing albums and start recording and releasing only singles. He said mm -hmm. that's what people are doing nowadays. So that's what I've been doing. In fact, Don's producing for me now. Really? Yeah. Well, good for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, happy about that. So um, you were at the Labyrinth, and then you were in the, the Reg, right? Yep. We, were, we moved to the Reg Studio Theater, and from there we went to the Robert H. Jackson Center, the Carl Kappa Theater uh, in Jamestown. And then I, well, let me think back. Then we went to uh, Shawbox. Shawbox, that's where I saw Tom yeah. Hill. Yeah, 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 Shawbox. One of the things that struck me the most about you during the, the show, intensely focused. You were not only the host, you were the producer, you were a performer, you were an organizer, you were counting, uh, some, you had somebody counting down for you, I think, in the background. But I mean, it was, it was pretty intense. How, how did you get all that to work? Yeah, no, it was very intense. <laughs> it definitely was, uh, yeah, and it was the 
uh, during the day of the show. I would, it would just build up and build up, and then I walked on the stage and uh, somehow got through that hour and a half, two hours, and then uh, I was wired for energy and didn't sleep for two days yeah. after that. No, it wasn't quite that much. But <laughs> no, it was a lot of focus. I felt like a, remember the Ed Sullivan show where they had those plate spinners? Yes. Uh, yeah, I felt like one of those guys, yeah. just running around doing this and that and the other thing. Like I said, I watched you doing it, I'm like, Whoo, this show is a whole lot easier to do than what you were doing. It, it, there's a lot to it. There's yeah. a lot of, uh, yeah. And uh, the interviewing, you know, you never, you, I'm sure you know, you never know quite how that's going to go and what direction it's going to take. <laughs> like Ramblin' Jack Elliott, you know, they call him Ramblin' Jack, not because he gets around the country, but because he never shuts up. <laughs> and the people said before he came, they said, people who knew him and had seen him, they said, you're going to have your hands full with this guy. And I said, you know what? Nobody out talks me. Not a problem. And every interview, <laughs> every interview segment was supposed to go two minutes. And Ramblin' Jack one time talked for 12 minutes. And I couldn't That's stop. That's your match. <laughs> stop. Yeah, the heavy-duty work Wait for, for the, the editor. You're waiting for that pause, and he never gave you the There's pause. There's never a no. comma when that guy talks. <laughs> and I can't, you know, I can't interrupt Ramblin' Jack Elliott, for Christ's sake. Yeah. He's, a, he's a legend. He's a living legend. So you go ahead and talk, Jack. We'll let the editor worry about this. <laughs> oh, boy. To, uh, these are fun stories that you hear, that people don't always hear about the behind the scenes stuff. So, Rolling Hills Radio. Where did that come from? The title. That was kind of a neat one. I don't know. I just woke up in the morning and there it was, Rolling Hills Radio. Yeah, <laughs> it's like writing a song. You know, yeah. you wake up and there's something in your head and you have to run to the to your guitar and get it down. That's the way it was with Rolling Hills Radio. I just woke up and there it was. So I understand. I understand. Yeah. It gushes out of you and you don't know where it comes from, but it's there. Exactly. It's like, wow, <laughs> like Chautauqua Sunrise. I, I pondered it for a while. And the next thing I said, I want it to be something that bright and shiny and starts today, you know, or your week or whatever. And there you go. Great name, too. Thank Chautauqua you. Sunrise. So, gosh, there was something that was mentioned in the show, and, I, and I'll get to it in a second. But I first heard the term with uh, Bill Ward here. He, he and I were doing an interview. And I said to him, what kind of music is this? Because I was finding myself doing more of this style. It's called Americana. And people say, what kind of music do you play? And I say, Americana. I, I can't quite define it myself. It's not exactly folk. It's not exactly bluegrass. It's not exactly rock. It's not, it's what we do. So how about you take a crack at it? Yeah, well, we talked about it on the show over and over again. What is this? And we kind of you know, amalgamation of lots of different kinds of music. Some people call it like America. It's the uh, melting pot. I think of it more like a quilt. Lots of different kinds mm -hmm. of music all over the place. We were lucky enough to have Daryl Scott, who's probably the best songwriter in Americana. And uh, he's, he's a towering figure. And I did not know this until he, I interviewed him on the show. There was actually a committee to try to figure out what they were going to do because these guys were country musicians. People like him and uh, so, uh, some of the other people that we had on the show and others like uh, Chris Christopherson who weren't fitting into modern country. All the slick stuff that's going on nowadays, mm -hmm. Toby Keith and all those yeah, guys. Yeah. And so Daryl Scott and that, that crew were getting squeezed out because they were rough and, in my mind, genuine. Yeah. <laughs> and they weren't corporate. They weren't going according to a formula. So they consciously split out and got together and said, okay, we're gonna make this our own if you will, subgenre, and there's actually a committee of of these musicians who came up with this name Americana. Okay. And it was when we started the show in 2010, there was no term Americana. Right. Gradually, it, it crept into the public consciousness, and I, I realized part of the way through our 10 years, oh, we're an Americana show. Of course we are, <laughs> because bluegrass, American jazz, uh, old time music, blues. Uh, Blues. We had some Absolutely. great blues yeah. players. That's all under the rubric of uh, Americana. You can do that. I'll go first, then I'll ask you. I, 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 people ask me all the time, uh, who influenced your music and your style? And I think, well, we all grew up with the Beatles. You know, that was sort of. But the Beatles were influenced by rockabilly, and, you know, and blues and all yeah. that sort of thing. So that was in the mix. And then I, I kind of got into country music a little bit. And then, you know, I did some bluegrass, and, and, and then after a while, you, you sort of, you absorb pieces that you really like about it, and the next thing you know, this is what you do, and this is what I do, you know, and uh, Americana, how about yourself? 
almost exactly the same. It, uh, I'm, I'm very eclectic in my taste, so uh, I didn't. I never knew what to call myself. Mm. When, you know, when I used to play uh, like bars and things like that, they'd say, "What do you play?" And so I'd say. Neil Young, Bob Dylan, <laughs> Tom Petty. I, I don't know what to do except name people, you know. But I think, and you might feel the same way, I think a lot of us, maybe all of us, stand on the shoulders of Bob Dylan. And he stood on the shoulders of Woody Guthrie. And maybe that's where it all sprang from. Dylan is more eclectic than people give him credit for. And, of course, the Beatles. So I, I agree with you. All of that, uh, everything kind of sprung from that. It, it's it's well. funny that you mentioned Dylan. Um, when I was growing up, the Beatles... The Dave Clark Five, The Stones, that was it. Dylan was like bouncing around in there, and I just, ah, he's, he's, he's a folky out of here. <laughs> well, you know, the, the circle goes around. Here I am, 50 some years later, Will Russell and I are playing together out, and we're doing stuff by the birds. Well, lo and behold, I find out that Dylan had written most of their stuff, and then I found something else they had written, and, and I have just an unbelievable new appreciation for Dylan, as you just said. It's, you don't realize all the stuff he wrote for other people. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. And the many styles and the incredible lyrics that he came up yeah. with. And I was, uh, you know, kind of like you. I, uh, it wasn't all that long ago people would say, you play folk, and I'd, I'd cringe and kind of cross my legs <laughs> a little bit. I, I don't know, but I'm not a folk musician for crying out loud. But I am. Yeah. I am, and I, and I proudly embrace that now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're talking about not only people like Dylan, but Tom Paxton and... Yeah. Uh, um, uh, Phil Oaks and all those wonderful, wonderful guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm proud to, to, if somebody calls me folk, I'm, that, I'm, I'm good that's with a that. great compliment. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so, uh, so Americana it is, and that, that's pretty cool. So, um, 96 shows. Did you ever have one that just gave you a bad time, a bad <laughs> interview? You talked about Ramblin' Jack, but was there one that's just like, oh my God, I can't wait to this get over with? You, and you don't have to, you don't have to list the person. <laughs> um, everybody was fun in their own way, no question about it. Some, like Tom Paxton, he's a very serious man. And, you know, it took me a while to settle into it because I'm not all that serious. Mm -hmm. And then I realized Tom has a lot of gravitas, and that's what he does on stage. And then there are others who just joke around and screw mm -hmm. around all the time, like John Latini. He was like a hilarious guy all the way through. We had a bunch of those kind of people. So I had to constantly shift <laughs> gears. And uh, yeah, there were, there were times when I kind of stepped in it. Um, I'll, I'll do that. And uh, you know, I certainly did it on the show. There were a couple times I had to edit out things that I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it happens, it happens. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, one of my favorite moments was uh, actually my very least favorite moment was when I tripped over the cord of Mary Ramsey's viola and knocked it on the floor. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> that was kind of hard to cover I, up. I referenced the, um, the show that we did for uh, Des Drew there, the um, Home for the Holidays. And they had my mic. Will had his mic. That's all we had. We, were, we had our direct. Uh, input there in those boxes, whatever you call those boxes, DI boxes, DR boxes, whatever it's called. And uh, for whatever reason, there was, I went to switch instruments and they still had a microphone on a little stand next to me. I never saw it. So you know what you do, you pull off your guitar to, to get the other instrument. I knocked that microphone phone over and it rolled like halfway across the stage and it was live. You go, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> Yeah. Like, oh my God. Funny things that happen, and, but that's that's the beauty of, of live music, isn't well, it? Well, it really is. It, it made the and we had so many bloopers. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> oh, every show, something you know, ju just something went wrong. Like I would cue the music, and the guy would put on the wrong music, or he just I don't know what he was doing back there, eating his hamburger or something, <laughs> and forget to push the button, so he had to do it over again. Uh. And but I think that was one of the wonderful things about the live show. People who went there live got to see the bloopers. They felt like they were part of the behind the scenes, mm -hmm. behind the curtain look at what goes into making a radio show. Okay, take a breath. Folks, you're watching and listening to uh, Chautauqua Sunrise. I'm Doc Hamels. My guest today is Ken Harley from Rolling Hills Radio. We're doing a look back as, as things are closing down for that. But if you have a question, you give us a call at 753-5225. Okay, 716-753-5225. Okay, so I asked you about one of your crazier moments. So you knocked your, your wiring down on our viola. How about if you could, if, if you, I always think of it like the best piece of pie or, or the best chocolate cake. 
what was the best moment on the stage with somebody that you could say, I'd love to do that all over again right this minute? Is there anything that sticks out? Oh, I'd have to think about that a little bit. Um, well, John McEwen, uh, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, of course, was, oh, gosh, a, was yeah. a groundbreaking album in 1970. And just mm -hmm. changed, the, the earth moved mm -hmm. when that album came out. And we were lucky enough for our finale to do with Will the Circle Be Unbroken, not just John and me, but a whole lot of local people. Dennis Drew, Bumpy Peterson, uh, Amanda Barton, uh, were the chorus for Will the Circle Be Unbroken. Very and cool. that was just a, just a chilling uh, And a for people experience. that know, it's basically a gospel song, right? It is, yeah. yes. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. real old. It is. Yeah, it's a great song. I, I actually have it in my lineup. I have to have oh, one yeah. or two gospel songs wherever I play somebody else. Can you do gospel? Yeah, I got a gospel song. Yeah, that and works. That's one of them. <laughs> yeah, that works. It's pretty much a standard nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it was a wonderful moment. It was a wonderful moment in the show. Gives you goosebumps. It did that I, th night. I think it would have. Yeah. Know, yeah. Okay, so you've got a, a bunch of uh, photos, and I thought maybe we start one or two and comment as you will, and then at no particular rate of speed here, you know, you can embellish as you want to, as you like. So, Jeff, if you want to pop up the first picture, and there we go. So, go ahead. Robin and Linda Williams, there they are. You know, when they walked into the, into the room the afternoon of the show, I just couldn't, I was just amazed. They're, I'm seeing them in person. Right. And the, the way I got them, by the way, was uh, uh, their Dobro player who toured with them for 10 years, mm -hmm. Kevin Maul, was a good friend of mine. He and I played in a band together and, I, and I, I tried through their agent to get a hold of them and they just weren't responsive. So I said, Dennis, or, excuse me, uh, Kevin, please tell those guys <laughs> they should be on the show. And he did, otherwise we could never have had All them right, For those that are familiar with these folks, tell, talk about them a little bit. Yeah, Robin and Linda, uh, started in the in the early 70s and um, they were bouncing around the country doing their duo thing and then they were discovered by Garrison Keillor mm -hmm. and they were regulars on Prairie Home Companion for, for a, until the until the program ended okay Wow okay who we got here Jonathan Edwards uh, sunshine go away oh, today yeah. Is big hit. yeah what a wonderful guy he is uh, uh, you know after the show he said, you and Kathy come on to, up to Maine anytime you want and stay with us. Just, a, just a, a real prince of a man. He's staying busy. He has put out, I don't know, 20 albums now since, uh, since his first one, since his first huge I, hit. I remember that song and I did it out years ago when it first came out and I did a horrible version of it. I never did it again. It's hard. <laughs> it's a hard, hard song to do. Hard. And, and Jonathan also, by the way, coincidentally, I opened for him in 1980. Wow. And, uh, he didn't remember it. I don't know why he didn't remember me. <laughs> but the one thing I remember about that, you know, we have guitar tuners now, and they clip oh, onto the end of yes, your guitar, yeah. and they're about that big, and they cost 30 bucks. The first one I ever saw Jonathan Edwards had one on stage, and it was on the floor, and it was as big as a home plate. <laughs> and it had all these lights and everything. I said, what in the world is that? And he said, it's a guitar tuner. I said, that, I don't, <laughs> Not that can't me. possibly be. Do you remember we used to use the tuning fork? You, you hit it on the table, oh, yeah. put it against the, the soundboard of your guitar, and go, Ooh, to see. <laughs> yeah, I know. And these younger guys say, how did you tune back in the day without tuners? And I say, well, we weren't. Never in, <laughs> we were never in tune. Very never, well. There's a familiar face. <laughs> Mary Ramsey, there she is. She was on the show, ah, oh, gee, I think four, four times she was with John. John and Mary were on the show twice. Mary brought her own band on once. 10,000 Maniacs were on the show, and we played at Chautauqua Institution. Now, she, she plays with John Lombardo. Yes. And it's John and Mary, but she has another band? Uh, uh, Mary Ramsey and the Healers, yes. Uh, they're a wonderful band. Okay. Of course, 10,000 Maniacs. And she's on, uh, 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 she, I just released a single a couple days ago. She's on that single. She was on my album. Well, let's uh, talk about that right now, the single. What, let's pr let's pr promote that. What's that all about? Oh, it's called uh, That Light. It's uh, the second single I've released. I got another one that's going to be released in a week or two. I'm, I'm going to be trying to release one single per month, as per okay. Don Dixon's recommendation. That Light was... Uh, you know, I came up with this riff, I, I wrote a song around it, uh, and I played it for Brian Bowers, the auto harp mm -hmm. pioneer and master. Uh, he lives in Washington State, and he said, yeah, come on out, Ken, you can stay in my backyard, we're going to see Mount Rainier. <laughs> so I did, I went, went to Washington, we went into his favorite studio and recorded the song together, sitting, just like old times, See, there was one microphone, mm -hmm. we, he and I sat around it, about three takes. Three go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did it, and I, you know, I went out and messed around with Brian Bowers around Washington State for the next three or four days. Came home, 
I listened to it and I said, you know, this really needs Mary Ramsey. So I, I mm -hmm. called Mary and she said, sure, I'll do that. She came down, put her part on and uh, Sweet. on the, and then, and then we released it. And uh, I've gotten more nice things people saying about that song than I did on my whole first album. So, <laughs> Uh, I really, and you, I you got it figured out finally. <laughs> finally, yeah, yeah, yeah. It took five years, but I, at least I got a song. How, how long have you been playing music? Well, uh, a long time. I was thirteen years old, so whatever that fifty some years. Yeah, I know. I, yeah. When people say how long have you been playing guitar, I go fifty. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I was a long time. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. How, how's this possible? You know, I, I tell these young kids. I said, we've all we've all forgotten more songs than you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. Wait, that's right. Oh, I know who this is. That's Cha Chapman. Tom Chapin. Yeah, there he is. He's on the show twice. Mm -hmm. The first time I had his daughters on, the Chapin sisters. And again, I, I was backstage. This is at the Reg. Mm -hmm. We played on the big stage. And I was going up some backstage stairs, and somebody was coming down. Uh -oh. and, I, and I looked at him, and I said, you're Tom Chapin. <laughs> and, he, and he said, yeah. <laughs> he and had come, because both of his daughters had just had babies. They were, one was like three weeks old, one was like two months old, mm. and Tom came to babysit for them backstage oh while they were on God. stage. Oh, how funny. So I convinced him to play a finale with us, which oh, he did, and he super. played a little bit of a concert at the end as well. Nice. And then he, he loves Jamestown, because Harry, his brother, had had, oh, had a connection yeah, with Jamestown. Right, right. And so Tom keeps coming back, and he liked the show, he loves Jamestown, so he came back and played at the Reg, and he drew more than anybody we ever had. <laughs> hold, the, hold that thought, we got a phone call. Good morning, caller. Good morning. Good morning, Jack. This is Linda Spaulding. Good morning, Hello. Ken. Hello, I, I don't Linda. know if you hear my dog barking in the background. He's, He's singing harmony. <laughs> 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 it's great to see you on the show, Ken. Ken, uh, I understand you're from Mayville. Did you go to Mayville Central School? I did, as a matter of fact, yes. Did you hear about Doug Spaulding for an English teacher ever? He was one of my very favorite teachers. Yes, I did. And he, got, uh -oh. <laughs> he actually got me interested in literature. I wouldn't be writing lyrics today if not for Doug. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, that was my husband, Doug. Yes. Yeah. Well, when they told me that you were from Mayville, well, he's taught everybody in Mayville. Jack, <laughs> did he teach you? No, I, 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 I came from Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> Does he was doing teaching up there? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's great to see you on the show. I just want to quickly announce that we're ready to hit the pavement to put our seniors back to work. It's about time. Yeah, we're getting calls from all my host sites, and we have job openings, and I'm ready to put people on. So uh, anything that you might be interested or think that you might be interested, please call me. The office for the aging number is 753-4471. My direct line, which would be better to call now, uh, with a lot of people still on furlough, is Seven five three four eight five six, and also there are other services with the Chautauqua County Office for the Aging. Okay, will do. And uh, maybe next time you call, give me give me a whole list of stuff, or send it in, or whatever, and I'll read it off for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. You got it. Thanks, but you Linda. have a wonderful Thanks, weekend and a wonderful week. Yeah. You too. Take care now. You too. Super. Bye bye. Okay. We we have all these matching stories here so you, yeah. you were with Doug that's great <laughs> yeah, yeah okay so let's pop up the next picture I, I know the Chapin singers they, or girls they can really sing together can't oh they? that was that was astounding we had an annual show at the Great Blue Heron and mm -hmm. there we are in the dance tent that's Jim Donovan uh, uh, late of Rusted Root and that's his band Jim Donovan and the Sun King Warriors they were incredible we we could never have had them on the regular show we needed a big loud stage for those guys well i guess they had little amplifiers four four drummers uh it was an amazing show those guys were very high energy and they're americana yes oh yeah 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 Electric the, the American. african beats uh -huh. and uh blended together with jim's kind of folky songs uh -huh. yeah absolutely cool. okay uh, mandolin there's our announcer julius east lahanley the voice Da, da, of da, da, Rolling da, da. Hills Radio. She, she, she joined us on, I think, season four. Was she writing your press releases? No, no, that was all me. And, uh, <laughs> I knew it, I knew it, yeah. I knew it. <laughs> Remember I've said that here, I go, who wrote this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. Oh, they're colorful. Oh, the Urban Pioneers. He looks they, like string bean. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, that's kind of, he plays old time banjo, uh, string bean played banjo as well, and 
She's amazing, Liz Sloan. She can play, there she was playing a violin, a, a fiddle behind her back. And actually, they were, uh, um, they were going to get married a week after the show, so we surprised them with a, with a bunch of wedding gifts oh, and things like cool. that. That was a wonderful time. Very cool. They're great. <laughs> Whoa, that's a big stick. It is. That's Hayes Carl on the, <clears throat> on the right of the screen. Hayes Carl, one of the up-and-coming Americana slash country kind of guys. That's Kevin Mall on the left with his dobro. Now, for people that don't know what a dobro is, want to explain that? Yeah, it's actually the predecessor to the uh, pedal steel. And it was made with a, it looks like a pie tin in the middle right. of it to make it louder so that it could be heard with bluegrass music. It came about in the, in the 19th. And, and they play it on their lap with the guitar facing up. With, yep. They, with a, do they play it with a little bar sometimes, don't they? They or? always play with a bar on their left hand, just like a pedal steel. Yeah. <clears throat> Move that up and down. The strings are very high, and then they use finger picks mm -hmm. to, uh, to pluck that thing. And we did this in Proctor's Theater in Schenectady. That's sure. thus the great big screen. Wow. Ramblin' Jack Elliott, there he is, and he was such a sociable guy. That's uh, Madison Hill with him, my granddaughter, <laughs> and uh, he was all about her. Why, well, you're Ken's granddaughter, are you? And then he started <laughs> into one of his stories, and I had to steer him in another direction. Well, there are other people here that want to talk to you, Jack. Um, what, what a great guy, just, a, uh, just loves life, mm -hmm. always positive. Uh, there we have Jen Sigget. On the left, uh, I met her actually. She and I, she and I did a songwriters workshop. I got uh, asked to do a songwriters workshop in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and mm -hmm. I arrived. And there was Jen. She and I did it together with a couple of other people. Very cool. And I met her, and she was so good. I invited her to be on the show. And there on the right is actually a, a folk legend. Her name is Christine Lavin. She's a real live wire. She's played with all the greats. Dave Von Runk taught her how to play guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, she, we were very lucky to have her on the show. You know, and one of the things that I think people forget that all these people, whoever they are, these musicians, unless they're, they're born into royalty, they're everyday people, picked up an instrument, had some creative juices, and honed yeah. their skills. Yeah, no doubt about it. And folk musicians, they now travel about the country making dozens of dollars. Okay. There we go. That's Todd Burge uh, on the, with a white coat on there. Uh, um, he has written so much. He's got, I think, he just put out his 13th album. Uh, and he's known as the Dean of West Virginia Songwriters. He's that good. And on the right, we have Don Dixon. He uh, is best known as a producer and as the inventor of a genre called jangle rock, which was kind of, kind of died on the uh, uh, folk Americana tree. But... He was a major influence to Elvis Costello <clears throat> and people like that. Also, he's a producer, produced people like Hootie and the Blowfish, uh, R.E.M., James McMurtry, and on and on. Jim Hardley. Now he's producing, <laughs> producing things for me. I have no idea how that came about, but Don said, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Yeah. Oh, there, <clears throat> there I am, uh, and uh, of course, Chautauqua Institution at the Amphitheater, mm -hmm. and it was a real honor to play that. We, we played, I think, five or six shows. So you around. play guitar, banjo, harmonica, anything else, mandolin? No, just those three, pretty just much. Well, a little ukulele every mm -hmm. now and then. But yeah, that's what I do. There's Daryl Scott, uh, probably the greatest songwriter in Americana. Um, He's colorful. He was colorful, yeah, as Robin Williams said. I can't hear you. Your shirt's so loud. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Yeah, Tom Paxton and the Don Wands. Don Wands. Wands. Yeah, the Don Wands were really amazing, and Tom came at 80, I think 87, 86 yeah. years old, and uh, you know did the show with as much energy at the end as he had it to be. His voice is just as smooth as it was the first day he recorded. I think it's just he just right there. He's ageless. He, he's just amazing. He, uh, he came, he, they made a six-hour car ride, a Ugh. car trip, to make it that day of the show, uh -huh. then the three hours to prepare, and then the two-hour show. And we got like one minute left, so let's, let's finish up on this one. Jim Lauderdale, the great uh, Nashville songwriter and performer, and we had local musicians come in. There's one of the greats right there, yeah. Amanda Barton. She's been here. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. She's so good. She played with Jim, she played with me, mm -hmm. and we played a finale at the end together. I'm glad we could have local musicians playing with the, with the greats like Excellent. Jim Lauderdale. We did that a lot. Kid Harley, Rolling Hills Radio, you got a half a minute. 
to wrap up the history of Rolling Hills and say whatever you want to say, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Well, I, first of all, I, I really appreciate the live audience and the support we had from Jamestown. When we started off, quite frankly, nobody knew a whole lot about this kind of music. And uh, it, it, it got traction. People really started liking it, and it was them that uh, kept the show going financially as, where, as well as our spirit. We connected, uh, we tried to connect with people's hearts, with genuine music, with the, with the compassion of humanity. That's what makes this music work, and we tried to convey that a positive message, just like your show. We try to keep a positive message coming forward. Ken Harley, 10 years of Rolling Hills Radio, a gift to our community. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, and good luck on your, your uh, future with your music and singles. You, you saw it right here, folks. I'm Doc Hamels, wrapping up another show of Chautauqua Sunrise. We're going to do it all again next Saturday morning here at 9 o'clock on Access Chautauqua, uh, 1301 on Spectrum. Ken Harley, good on you and good on all the folks that participate in Rolling Hills Radio. It's a treasure that we have now encapsulated forever and ever. So take care, everybody. Have a great week and stay dry and wear those masks. <laughs> it's working. Keep yeah. it up. Yeah, got mine right here.